powerful affirmation right there should display to you the awesome servitude of volunteers that teach our children every Sunday about Jesus Christ. And then also the wondrous spirit that they have to want to stand in front of a group of strangers and sing about him. So I praise our servant leaders that teach our kids about Jesus Christ to speak and sing so boldly about him. And I applaud the parents as well for reinforcing that. Now, if we can get the adults to do that, <laughs> my oh my, what a revival we will have. Maybe Carson and Bella need to preach today. <laughs> I am so very thankful that I got an extra hour of sleep last night. Don't like losing it in the spring? Hope everyone had a great time for Halloween or... For you hardcore Christians, happy Reformation Day or a trunk or treat. Uh, I'll be honest, this week uh, has been an awesome week pastorally. I've been really blessed to take a lot of time to be able to minister and be a friend to many of you. And I don't take that for granted. It's an honor. And I hope that any of you that confide in me and want to speak to me that... It's probably just as much a teaching and a learning experience for me as it is for you. Uh, we make each other better. Uh, we're at war with ourselves and with a devil who's a jerk. Uh, and with that said, this sermon uh, seemed to be harder than most to put together. So I am faithfully hoping that God will most certainly intervene uh, during this sermon because this is one of those that I felt most uncomfortable standing before you today. So I pray for your grace and mercy for sure. I've enjoyed studying First and Second Samuel. I thank God for his sovereign plan over fallen people including pastors like myself. Again, though, if, if the Bible was a fairy tale, there is no way, no how, a human author or their editor would have kept many or any chapters of it. Instead, we see it all. But most importantly, we see the incredible redemption of God's people in the Bible. God laid out his plan for these people with the same triumphs, the same trials, and sin. We should always cling to that very same hope. That hope has lasted over 2,000 years according to human terms, but it's been here since the beginning. As I've gotten older, there have been moments of reflection about my death. What will the service look like? Who will be there? Will my family be taken care of? How quickly will Lindsay find a better 2.0 version of me? <laughs> Just kidding. I hope. <laughs> I just want her and my kids to be safe and heaven bound. Conviction usually hits me at this point of my own misery, not of my wife finding a Matthew McConaughey version, <laughs> but just of just running through, and, I, and I'm going to have to steal from the AME's uh, worship here. If I happen to be called home before you, don't call it a funeral. Call it a homegoing. A homegoing celebration. And we will celebrate. Don't cry. So just, just remind Lindsay of that when she's got that other bow next to her. <laughs> because regardless of when it happens, when, it's not an if, when it happens, it shouldn't really matter. It shouldn't really matter. Because I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven and I know my family will be there soon enough. Without a doubt, there's nothing... You can question me about Tennessee football and I'll be shaky as all can get out. But I'm not uncertain of where I'm headed and where my family will be as well. Sadly, it's that sin of pride within me that makes me wonder. 
We want affirmation from the world so badly. How can we harness that sin and revert it instead to seeking God's affirmation? Instead. Well, the first thing we have to do is admit our sin and repent of it. And it brings me to today's message in 2 Samuel 20. I'd ask you to open your Bibles to 2 Samuel, which is in the Old Testament, which is the first half of the book. And it's what book of the Bible? How many numbers? Ten. Ten. There you go. So I'd ask you to flip over to the 20th chapter and follow with me. If you don't have a Bible, we also have Bibles underneath our chairs. You're welcome to have that. Take it home with you. If you know someone that needs one, take it and give it to them as a gift. Compliments from you or either Siwi Bay. And if it's easier for you, we'll also have them on the screens as well. And since it's such a big text, I'm going to break up parts of it and just hit on some main themes and our application points. I remember sending it to Heather earlier today and she's like, wow, this is really great. People getting beheaded and entrails being spilled out. Boy, I can't wait to hear about this message. <laughs> so fortunately, I'm going to leave a lot of that part out and just go ahead and share that that's a part of this chapter, but we'll dive into that here in a minute. So follow with me in 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. Now there happened to be there a worthless man whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjaminite. And most of us would just read that and it just kept trolling right along. But God doesn't make mistakes there. And there happened to be a worthless man. Now maybe some of your Bibles say, troublemaker, good for nothing, or man of Belial. Well, Belial has been used in the Bible over two dozen times and is attributed to a demon, even Satan itself, in 2 Corinthians chapter 16. But Belial is the sum of all the lawlessness, wickedness, and worthlessness in a single being. If you'll remember in 1 Samuel, Eli's sons were described as sons of Belial. And since we proclaim the Bible to be unmistakably God's word, this man Sheba is recorded in history to be worthless in God's eyes despite his own nationality within the Benjaminite tribe of Israel. So if you're a guest and you're joining us for the first time in our study of Samuel, David, who slayed Goliath, has become king of Israel after Saul. But he becomes a bonehead and commits multiple sins in his affairs with Bathsheba, including the death of her husband. And then God confronts David through his friend, Nathan. And he gives David forgiveness upon his repentance, but God also forewarned David that his sins will have disastrous impacts within his own family and within the nation of Israel. And since his sins, there has been one violent coup after another on David's reign. Most have come from within his own family. If you were here last week, you'll remember that we discussed Absalom, one of his sons, and his downfall in chapter 18. As well as afterward, David trying to begin reconciling the two kingdoms of Judah and Israel to have them become one Again, but just as we and probably David believes reconciliation is always at hand among God's people, in walks Sheba who's compelled to lead a rebellion. As we see later, many decided to follow Sheba in their rebellion against David. But why would so many people follow a worthless, wicked, good-for-nothing troublemaker to defy whom God had anointed to be their king. Well, just as we seek candidates for office within our local and state and even national elections, we are drawn, unfortunately and fortunately, 
to candidates that generally operate and view the country through our same lens. Our lens. Not God's, ours. Maybe the same people who followed Sheba were equally worthless and wicked and good-for-nothing troublemakers. Earlier, I confronted us about our visions about our funeral services and what they'd look like. And we get wrapped up in who will be there, what will be said verbally and non-verbally on our tombstone, and how will our families be protected. We want to be remembered for something in the eyes of our friends and our family. We want our life to have meant something, right? And so we live our lives within this lens to present an image of worthiness before our friends and family and even strangers' eyes. And it's exhausting. Because we end up like David in a moment in temporary peace while just over the horizon is another coup trying to knock on our own door. And in the end, we could have all the shiny trophies, all the notorieties, and all the accolades from our fellow man and woman. But we'll be considered worthless before God dies. Jesus teaches us that in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You workers of lawlessness is also known as worthless, good-for-nothing troublemakers, Sheba wannabes. If this scares you, good. It scares me too. But we can make a change. But that change will affect our spiritual, our physical, our mental, and social lives when we make it. And we have to address the first thing. Be worthy in God's eyes first. Be worthy in God's eyes first. Thanks, Chris, for that simple and obvious statement. Glad you went to seminary to really come up with that profound application point. Well, my response in not-so-seminary but more redneck terminology would be, if it's so simple, then why aren't we living it? We don't understand God nor the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is someone who we can ask for favors and get those favors as we strive to live the good life, right? God is okay for us to continue down our sinful paths as long as we just throw up a few Hail Marys or I'm sorry. But we are never moved enough to change our behavior pattern. God is our life insurance policy, not our babysitter. All of those statements are wrong and sinful. And they paint God not as the king of kings, but as a butler. And if we seek our friends and our family's worth more than God, what does that say about who we think God is? When we pray, do we pray like Ricky Bobby from Talladega Nights to an eight-pound, six-ounce newborn baby Jesus? Or is it the creator of the universe and author of your life? Paul writes in Philippians, Therefore God has highly exalted him, meaning Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. His name above every other name, including our best friends, family, and colleagues. When his name is mentioned, every knee is bowed and every tongue confessed. Not a few or some, but every knee. 
Jesus says in Matthew 10, And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Our cross is sacrificing our own self-interest for the sake of others hearing and seeing how Jesus Christ changed our life. That's our cross. I don't, it doesn't matter if you think I'm worthy within the world scope. I want to tell you how jacked up I am personally and spiritually and how Jesus still loves me anyway. <laughs> and not be afraid to share that with somebody. Paul writes in, I know it seems strange and difficult, but it's really not. We've actually been sacrificing Jesus Christ for the sake of our own self-interests for years. God's just saying, you need to reverse that. Put me first. Paul writes in Galatians 1, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Multiple things happening there. Our transformed lives through the salvation of Jesus Christ displays and bears outward appeals for God to others. And we are not satisfied with just a common knowledge of who God is. We increase our relational knowledge with God through the study of God's Word daily. We become so in tune with our relationship with God that we reflect Paul's writing in Philippians 1.27. Only let the manner of your life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. We aren't called to be Sunday Christians, but everyday evangelists for God's testimony in our life. Not expecting you to be a full-blown scholar in Scripture. God changed your life uniquely. And believe it or not, He's appointing people within your spheres of influence to share how He transformed your life so that He can transform theirs. We have to be committed to seeing and hearing our Savior say similar when we see Him again in Matthew 25. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. We have to start prioritizing God's worth above our own self-worth. And remind ourselves every single morning. It will be a daily battle with our, in our mind, heart, and soul. Because we are inevitably drawn to oppose it. It leads me to your next sermon note. I want you guys to say this out loud to me. Because the first part is confession. I am born to rebel. I didn't hear you enough. That was weak sauce. I am born to rebel. So here we got Sheba in verse 20 and verse 2. And he blew the trumpet and said, We've got no portion in David. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Remind you now that that's the root of Jesse where Jesus Christ will come from. Every man to his tent, so Israel. And so all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from Jordan to Jerusalem. You know that old phrase, he or she loves to blow his own horn? That sounds a lot like Sheba. Blowing the horn meant leaving and retreating away from David's reign. Sheba was ultimately telling the people that they had no relationship with David or his descendants, although God and the people had anointed David as their king of their country. And that same rallying cry was used by Saul and Absalom and Jeroboam in their efforts to usurp authority of God's anointed kings. 
And it all began with Adam and Eve's decision to fall into temptation to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to sling a bunch of Romans on you because I just I started swimming in it. Romans 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. It was a type of the one who was to come. Our sinful nature, as we walk through this life, tends to betray our parents, our family members, or society for the cause of our transgressions. The temptations may have been there, but our lean into sin has been within our soul since birth. Romans 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I don't understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. I have a desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. And now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin. As much as we try to dress up ourselves as stand up and worthy people before others' eyes, God sees our true intentions. You can fool me, you can fool everyone else, but God is going to see right through that. And he saw right through Sheba, who is a part of the tribe of Israel, but yet he called him a worthless person. Our intentions are always self-serving and more than likely in direct opposition to his call on our life. Romans 6. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Either of sin, which leads to death, and of obedience, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Where do you stand today? We have to understand that that first part, if, it, if you become a slave to the sin, it's going to lead to your death. And it leads me to your next sermon note. My rebellion leads to death. So... I'm going to jump through the entrails and all that fun stuff and get to where Sheba is now on the run and he's in a fortified city and David's men are chasing him. And they can't enter the city because they're not allowed to enter it yet. So here, 2 Samuel, verses 16 through 22. And then a wise woman called from the city, Listen, listen! Tell Joab, come here that I may speak to you. Joab's the general under David's army. And Joab came near her, and the woman said, Are you Joab? And he answered, I am. She said to him, Listen to the words of your servant. And he answered, I'm listening. She said, They used to say in former times, Let them but ask counsel at Abel. And so they settled a matter. I am one of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why will you swallow up the heritage of the Lord? And Joab answered, Far be it from me, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. That's not true. But a man of the hill country of Ephraim called Sheba, the son of Bichri, has lifted up his hands against King David. Give up him alone, and I'll withdraw from the city." The woman said to Job, Behold, his head shall be thrown to you over the wall. And the woman went over to all the people in her wisdom. They cut off his head 
and they threw it out to Job. They blew the trumpet, dispersed from the city, and every man to his home, and Job returned to Jerusalem to the king. It's gruesome. It's ugly. Sheba, who leads an insurrection against David, hides within this fortified city from David's armies. And despite his apparent security within this fortified city, God had appointed that meeting of a wise woman in Job. It wasn't an overwhelming force that broke down through those fortified walls, but a wise woman with a godly appointment and respect among her peers to confront and kill an insurrectionist within her town. Sheba had all these hopes of grandeur and becoming the king of Israel. But his intentions were self-serving and disobedient to God's appointed plan. <laughs> Sheba wanted to live his life to the fullest on earth. And his plan fulfilled his dream. The problem in fulfilling his dreams was the destruction and dissension that impacted thousands of lives. He was worried about him. He didn't care whom it affected. It was all about Sheba. Towns were damaged. People were killed for his selfish desires, including his own. We are no different in living out our daily lives either. We have this grand idea of greatness on earth that will inevitably lead to despair and destruction and even death. But we still want our legacies to live forever. What if we just changed our mindset on death? As believers of Jesus Christ, we are faithful in living for eternity in heaven. We are even guaranteed treasures beyond all our understanding and any accumulated wealth that we have here. Jesus tells us in John 14, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. The Son of God has prepared a place for you and me. With no disease, no violence, no despair, no suffering for eternity. Death is not the final chapter in our lives. It should be a continuation of living for our Savior on heaven as we did it here on earth. And we'll answer someday to a different trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed. For this perishable body must be put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. That's eternity. Being joined with our body. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? This is the power of a Savior within our lives. You get a bad diagnosis? O death, where is your sting? I am living for Jesus Christ whether I am ill or not. You lose your job? Oh, death, where is your sting? I know the power of my Savior, and I know He has a plan. You going through a tough time personally, maritally? Oh, death, where is your sting? You anointed me, God, to be with this person. Oh, help us overcome. That is the power of a Savior, and no one in this world can offer you more. But you have to believe it. You have to be faithful in it. 
You have to know that your Savior lives in you and your relationship has to get right with him to overcome all things. We aren't interested in accumulating earthly accolades or shiny things because our greatest achievement is our Savior's love. That's all we need. We get overwhelmed in the world's oppression and depression. But we should be offering hope and grace to every man, woman, and child within our reach. We strive for unity and reconciliation even among our enemies. And to the world's and even, unfortunately, some church's eyes, the perceived least of these. Because our Savior, he did it for us. And we are called to share that same mercy, that same grace, and that same love with every person we meet. Our stations in life should become ministries for our spheres of influences on earth. So they become fully appreciated in heaven. I'd rather friends of mine that I've shared the gospel with thank me when they're in heaven. I say, thank you for sharing your testimony with me. It changed my life and Jesus changed me. Rather than, why didn't you share it with me? You're a pastor. Why didn't you tell me about Jesus? And now I'm lost. So I want to challenge each of you today to stop seeking glory from your friends and family. It is hollow and it is depressing and it is a dead end. Start sharing his glory through his salvation in your life with your friends and family. Do that by waking up in the morning and just thanking God for giving you a breath every day. Start there. Do that by seeking his counsel through prayer and reading his word every day. Do that by following his direction and even seeking forgiveness to him and others when you fall. Because as much as that instruction book gives an awesome day by day on how to do it, we tend to just make a step, misstep or two. And the beauty of our salvation is when we accept where we've made a mistake and we tell others, including our Father, where we've made a misstep and we don't come back. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ yet, come forward. Ask that the Savior to take away all of your sin. If you still have questions and you're just not there yet in your relationship with God, that's okay. I want to encourage you to get that community card in the back of the seat and write down your questions. And if you want to specifically hand it to me, I'll be happy to look at it and I will talk to you about it. You can call me. You can email me so that we can have candid, honest, and open conversations about the greatest gift, the greatest treasure of all, Jesus Christ. I've told you time and time again, I don't care how many people come to See We Bay in the future. God has appointed each and every one of you here right now. And my role as your pastor is to make certain that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Because if I don't make certain that that is, on, that is right, then I'll fail when those hundreds come afterwards. Those hundreds won't come at all because you're not in the same place that you should be with Christ. Because it's going to be your testimony that brings them here. So wherever you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you that it can get a lot closer. And you've got men and women here that want to support you and love you and help you get to where you need to be. Because, Lord, let me tell you, I know I need to be a lot better. So let's do it together instead of trying to do it separately. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.